So let's get started. So the first question I want to start out with is, what's a lambda expression? Well, a lambda expression is an anonymous function. It's actually a cute little anonymous function. So let's take a look at an example of using a lambda expression just to get a feel. Let's say we are creating a thread in, in this case, and I'm going to say new thread, and within this, I'm going to say thread dot start, and then let's say in this case in, let's say, main, and obviously this code is running within the main function. But what I want to do is let something run in another thread. Well, how would we normally go about doing it? We would say new runnable, and then within this, we would say public void run, and then in this case, I can say in another, let's say, thread over here. Well, clearly we can see that the main thread is running, and then of course the other thread kicked in, and then we can see an another thread running. But if you look at this code, this is a code we have all written a million times, but it's been around for a fairly long time as well. We call this anonymous in our classes, but I would like to call this out as missed opportunity because instead of creating anonymous in our classes, they should have actually created lambda expressions back then. But this is a lot of ceremony, a lot of noise in the code we can see. But if you really think about what our intention is in this code, our intention is to run that one line of code in another thread. Well, rather than just saying, go run that one line of code, we took that one line of code, wrapped it into a function with a name called run, and then passed that function or wrapped that function into an anonymous inner class. That's a lot of work. So it's as if we've been treating functions like they are kindergarten children. This little code comes to you and says, could I please go to the neighborhood park, please? And you say, no, sweetie, you cannot go alone. Let me send an adult with you. So we've been kind of wrapping these and passing them around, and it's as if this little code finally gets its freedom to be on its own and, and walk around. So what I'm going to do here is take this code, and I'm going to save this away as high ceremony. So high ceremony, and I'm going to just, that's where I'm saving it. I'll zip it up eventually. So what I'm going to do is remove the part that is ceremonious. If you look at this code right here, that part I've highlighted is a pure noise. It doesn't really add any value. So if you really think about functions, we can say that a function has uh, typically uh, four things. So uh, there are four things a function typically has. The first one that a function has is often a name. That's what we generally look at to begin with. Then we, have, of course, have a parameter list. And of course, we have a body of a function, but we also have a return type as well. So these are are typically the four things that functions uh, have. Well, but if you think about it, what is the most important parts of a function? We can argue the most important part a function has is the body of the function. Because without a body, there is really not a whole lot to do with the function. So the body of a function is extremely important. But then, uh, then comes the parameter list, because we can't do what we want to do without knowing what we are working with. So these two become extremely important. Well, what about the name and the return type? Well, the name and the return type really don't have too much value, well, a function can be anonymous, who cares about the name, and the return type can be inferred as well, so we don't really care about those two. So a lambda expression typically has only those two things. A lambda expression has a parameter uh, list, and then it also contains the body of the function. It doesn't have a name. It doesn't have a return type. Those two are kind of removed. So going back to this particular function we have, I'm going to come down here and remove all that noise. That is our parameter list right there. I'm going to replace this with a little arrow, and then I'm going to remove the remainder of the ceremony from this code. So we distill this nicely to just a lambda expression. So we can see, in this case, we have the parameter list to the left of the arrow, and then we have the body of the function to the right of the arrow. And so this becomes a very concise, cute little anonymous function, which has exactly what we are looking for without all that ceremony that we saw a few minutes ago. So the name becomes anonymous in this case, so we don't have a name, and also the parameter type is inferred, so we don't have that also. So what we are left with is just that part, which contains just the body and the, and the parameter list itself. So we'll just save this away as uh, uh, just the uh, essence with the lambda expression we are seeing here.
That's all we created. Well, we saw what a lambda expression is, but how does this really fit into the Java philosophy? Now, this is one thing I really appreciate with what Java has done, because if you really think about it, lambdas are definitely not new to Java at all. Lambdas have been around for a very long time, and, and, and a number of languages have lambdas. So when it comes to Java, when I was learning Java 8, what I was curious about really is not lambdas itself, Itself because I knew what they were, but I was really curious about what does it really mean to have lambdas in Java? And, and what I found out was something very refreshing. Well, one of the philosophies of Java, if you really look back from way back from the time from Java 1 time frame all the way to now, is about backward compatibility. Now, if you look at languages like you know, C Sharp and Scala, those languages often don't care about backward compatibility. Uh, uh, in, in, an example is in C Sharp. Almost every time C Sharp introduces a feature, and don't get me wrong, they are wonderful features. I really like what C Sharp has done. But one thing about C Sharp is they would introduce a new feature and say, oh, look at how cool this is. And you're going to say, this is awesome. But how do I use it with my current code? Well, good luck. Forget it. Go home. Work with your old code. Here's the new way stuff, and here's how you do new stuff. Well, so what happens when a language doesn't support backward compatibility? So this is this is something we have learned really well over the past few decades. If a language does not support backward compatibility, it is doomed. We also know that if a language supports backward compatibility, it's also doomed. So the beauty of backward compatibility is you're doomed either way. Whether you do it or you don't, you're doomed. And so it's a question of really choosing which way you like to be doomed. And Java decided to be doomed by supporting backward compatibility. That's been the central philosophy of Java all along. So Java says, no matter what, we'll pro provide backward compatibility. And, and in this spirit, Java has done a fairly good job in supporting backward compatibility and making lambdas useful, even with a very old code. Notice in this example, I took a code which is about 20 years old, the thread constructor, and to the thread constructor, I was able to pass a lambda expression. That's something to really appreciate in my opinion, because you didn't say, here are lambdas, and you can use it with new API. Well, they said, here are lambdas, and you could even use it with existing API without even bothering to change the existing API a bit. So the way they did this is by making lambdas compatible with, or in other words, lambdas in Java 8, that's one of the reasons why they are backed by single abstract method interfaces. So if you have interfaces that have a single abstract method, for example, you have your runnable callable action listener file filter or your own homegrown single abstract method interfaces, you can readily use lambdas instead of using anonymous inner classes anywhere a single abstract method interface is expected. So this is absolutely powerful in terms of taking existing APIs, existing libraries, and being able to pass lambdas to it. There is not, that's not only the benefit, there's another benefit as well. I've got some clients that are currently developing applications where their users are divided between Java 7 and Java 8. What they are doing is they are designing their libraries and APIs to use single abstract method interfaces. So their Java 7 users are passing anonymous inner classes wherein their current Java 8 users are readily passing Lambda expressions. So this is a very nice nice transitional path to go from pre-Java 8 to Java 8 because you can design your APIs to use single abstract method interfaces and current Java 7 or previous version users can pass Lambda anonymous inner classes and then when they transition to Java 8, they can start using Lambda expressions and your APIs have much more longevity because of that. We actually can see this in quite a number of APIs out there that do support this kind of functionality and we are able to actually use them very effectively between Java 7 and Java 8 for the same reason. And we get the elegance and the conciseness that Java 8 provides when it comes to using in Java 8 itself. So that's basically what we saw here is how we can benefit from this particular uh, you know, uh, philosophy that it provides the backward compatibility really nicely.
nicely. That's one of the things. But the next question, though, is how does this really work when it comes to, you know, uh, under the hood? So let's, to understand, Let's get back to something else for a minute. Let's say in this case, uh, what I had a minute ago, I had a runnable that I had created. So if you go back to this code I had just a little bit ago, I've got this nice little runnable as you can see right here. And of course, in this case, I've created this object of runnable and passed it around. But then we saw rather than having to write that much of code, you can easily replace that with a simple, uh, you know, language lambda expression we saw that as well and then we can write this instead of writing all that extra code now that's really great that's a lot of uh, code reduction so when you move into java 8 your code goes through a, a, a little weight loss you know program there so you are about seeing 40 to 50% reduction in code size depending on what part of code you are seeing however but looking through this, it might give us an illusion that all they did was provide a syntax sugar. So it appears as though instead of passing an anonymous in our class, you could pass a lambda. So we can naively think all that the compiler did is swallow the lambda and simply write this runnable and then provide the run method and all those good stuff. Well, let's see what would happen if the compiler were to do that. Well, if the compiler were to simply replace a lambda with the anonymous inner class, what would happen? Well, you would write this code, and what would the compiler do? The compiler would replace that code with this code, obviously, because all that the compiler would be doing then is replace lambda with anonymous inner classes. Well, let's entertain the thought for a minute. Now, what would actually happen if we were to be replacing that code with the other piece of code? What would then happen? Well, what would happen is, if you notice in this case, let's quickly go over here and take a look at what's on the disk. And you will notice quickly that on the disk I have, uh, let's look for sample, and you can see that there are two classes already, a sample class and a sample dollar one class, both of those sitting right there. Well, but getting back here, if you were writing lambda expressions, what would happen? Well, you're going to write this beautiful looking code, and once you have written this code, you're not going to be simply happy with this code after all. You probably would want to write a lot of these code like this after all. So what would, you, what would you do? You probably would be writing lambdas several times over in your code. Not exactly this way, but the point is you would be using lambdas quite, quite a bit. Well, if you're going to use lambdas quite a bit, what would the compiler then be doing? Well, the compiler would then be replacing all your lambdas absolutely. And the way the compiler would be replacing all those lambdas is it would do something like this. It would take each of those lambdas and replace it with anonymous inner classes. Well, when that happens, what's going to be the consequence of that code? Well, once the lambdas are replaced by that particular code, well, what's going to even eventually happen is the compiler is going to compile through replacing the lambdas with anonymous inner classes, but then you come along and you're going to see a lot of anonymous inner classes. That's not going to make anybody happy in the world. Because when you have such a bloating of anonymous inner classes, that's not going to be a lot of fun at all. Now the question is, why wouldn't that be a problem? Why would that be a problem? Well, before we talk about why that would be a problem, let's th talk about what is solutions that is out there. You may quickly point out and say, but wait a minute, that's what other languages have done in the past as well. For example, if you look at other languages in the JVM, what about Groovy? What about Scala? Well, just for the sake of record, Scala is changing, and Scala in 2.12 is not going to do what I'm going to show you here. So I want you to take it with a grain of salt. I'm not trying to paint a black picture for Java forever, or a dark picture for it forever, but that's what it is today. So let's quickly take a look 
look at what uh, you know Scala is going to do real quick. Well, if I go to this example in Scala for a minute, let's say I've got a list over here equals list of let's say one and two, and I'm going to say list dot for each, and I'm taking the value here. I'm going to simply print the value. So I've just written a little code in Scala that's going to just print the value in this particular list. So let's say Scala, and I run the sample right here, and you can see in this case it's going to run through and print the value in the sample. But quickly though, I want to find out what's in here. So Scala minus save sample dot Scala. This creates a sample dot jar for us. Let's go ahead and say jar XF and take a look at what's in the jar. And you will notice quickly there are those anonymous inner classes. So in other words, the, as of today, even though this is changing very quickly, that's exactly what Scala is doing. That's exactly what Groovy is doing. They create all these anonymous inner classes. Well, you may say, but wait, wait a minute. If that's what you know, Groovy is doing, that's what Scala is doing, why cannot Java do the same thing? Well, there's one difference between Java doing it and other languages doing it. And the difference is Java has 9 million programmers. When 9 million programmers use your language, and out of which 1 million programmer, programmers know where you live, you have to decide things very differently. And so they cannot simply just say, oh, you know what, never mind, that's what everybody else is doing, we'll do the same thing. Because the scale is extremely different. In fact, it's good that Java thought about this very differently, and that's exactly why all the other JVM languages can now start ben benefiting from it. Now, let, let's see why this is not a good idea to create these anonymous inner classes. The more anonymous inner classes you create, the more anonymous classes you have on the disk. And clearly, that's not going to be fun. You're going to have a bloated, big jar files. Well, loading those jar files is going to take more time. And once you load the jar files, you got more memory footprint when the JVM is going to run because of these bigger jar files and more classes. And more classes and more bigger footprint we have, the objects you end up creating, these anonymous objects, you're going to create a lot of garbage. And the more garbage you create, the more time you're going to spend collecting those garbage garbage, and your runtime memory footprint is going to increase even further as well, well, none of these is going to really help us in the long run. So they were struggling with this problem and saying, how in the world are we going to fix it? And while they were thinking through this, leave the thought aside for a minute, we'll come back to it. They were working on Java 7, and they came across a feature that they wanted to implement. And this feature really was not needed in Java at that time, but this feature was purely implemented just for the sake of these other languages on the JVM, which are the dynamically typed languages. And so like JRuby and Groovy, for example, and they said, what if we can provide a feature to make these language execution faster. Now, clearly, if you think about this, this was not needed for any reason in Java itself. This was a really, the best way I can describe is, I can only describe this as an as a act of kindness. Because they just took it upon themselves and said, look at our brothers and sisters programming in these dynamic type languages. What can we do to make their lives better? And so they implemented this feature in the, in the Java 7 time. And the feature uh, is invoke dynamic. As you can see, the word invoke dynamic uh, contains two words in it. The word invoke and the word dynamic, and invoke dynamic simply says you can attach and detach to the a uh, function you want to invoke dynamically, and then you can reattach it as well at runtime. So this gives you a call site for functions. In other words, you can celebrate that finally function pointers are available on the JVM for us to use at the program level. Well, that's exactly what an invoke dynamic provides, and they implemented invoke dynamic for these languages. As they were struggling with Java 8 to really eliminate these anonymous inner classes, it dawned on them to say, wait a second. What if we were to use invoke dynamic to implement lambda expressions? At first thought, this was a crazy idea because why would you want to implement a feature implemented for dynamic type languages 
Why do you want to implement that to implement Java? On a second thought, this appeared to be a brilliant idea. The use case is now different. So they went back and rewrote Invoke Dynamic in Java 8 because their intention of Invoke Dynamic now no longer was to support dynamic type languages. Even though the dynamic type languages could benefit from it, the use case was predominantly to support Lambda expressions. So as a result, they completely rewrote it and implemented this in Java 8 to provide the benefits for Lambda expressions. So now, notice that in this code, I got plenty of Lambda expressions. I don't have a single anonymous inner class on my hand right now. Now, if I go back here to the code, and if I say, uh, uh, you know, look for classes, sample, look at the quietness, there are no longer anonymous inner classes left on the disk. Those went away. Well, when I use lambdas, even though I can use anonymous inner classes or lambdas in the code, uh, whenever you use anonymous, uh, lambda expressions, it does not get replaced by anonymous inner classes, which means I don't have the overhead of creating anonymous objects, which means I don't have the overhead of deleting or garbage collecting objects that I would otherwise have created. But the question then is, how is this implemented? If I use Java P minus C, and minus C is an option on my machine already, if I take a look at what's under the hood, you would notice that every Every one of these things have become calls to invoke dynamic. So in other words, when you create a lambda expression, the call to the lambda expression simply becomes an invoke dynamic. And the lambda expression itself will become one of three things. It might become a static method, depending on the context, or it could become an instance method, or it could become a simple routing of the invoke dynamic to an existing method in another class, depending on the context. And we'll, we can take a look at this a little later to see how that's going to work out. So this is basically the idea behind this, is that we don't have the overhead of creating these objects. So what you can see here is the feature they implemented originally to help these dynamic type languages really paid huge dividend for implementing one of the most important features in the next version of Java. So if at all anything, I see this as a great lesson in good karma. So if you do good things to other people, it always comes back you know, as a better thing. And that's basically what this is kind of showing us as a, as a real nice story, as how this is really benefited in terms of how that's actually working. So we saw in this case how we uh, lambdas are really implemented under the hood they really are manifesting themselves as uh, invoke dynamic calls pretty effectively. So given this, let's understand how we're going to benefit from lambdas. We have talked about what lambdas are. We have talked about when to use a lambda. And we have talked about how lambdas actually get implemented under the hood. And we also saw how lambdas are so ubiquitous that they can be used with existing API as well whenever there is uh, you know, an anonymous uh, interface with a single anonymous uh, function in it. That's quite a few things already, but let's go to and look for how this is going to be changing the way we program with this. So I'm going to start with a little iteration, and I'm going to look for an imperative style, and then I'm going to show you the functional style and how that's going to uh, you know, change. So let's take a look at an example of list of numbers, let's say 1 to 10. And I want to really uh, iterate and loop through and print through all these different values. So how would I go about looping through and printing these values? Well, first of all, we can use what we are very familiar with, which is an external, so external iterators. So what is an external iterator? An external iterator is what we have used in Java for a very, very long time. Time. An external iterator is where you control the iteration all by yourself. You say what you want to do, how to do it, when to do it, and you have complete control of the iteration. Now, having complete control of things is not generally a good thing, even though it may appear to be a good thing the way it is being said. Oh, you have a complete control of things. Well, the more you control, the more you have to change when you have to change what you control. That's a big disadvantage 
advantage you have to work with. So given this, let's talk about how do we iterate through these values. So for int i equal to 0, i less than, and what are we going to do here? Well, we're going to say numbers start, and you got to ask yourselves, how do you get the size of this uh, you know, collection? Is it dot length? Is it dot size? Is it dot count? Well, if it's an array, you use a length. If it's a list, you have to use a size. So you got to pass and think a little bit. And then you say i plus plus, pass again. Is it a less than or is it less than or equal to? Well, sometimes it's less than, sometimes it's less than or equal to. You got to make the decision as well. And then you have to output numbers.get and then a little bit more work as well to get that work done. So you can see in this case how much more effort it takes to really iterate and print the values. Now, sometimes people will tell you that this is a simple for loop. But the word we are using here is, is we are confused. The word here we are looking for is not a simple. The word we are looking for is the word familiar. And there is a very big difference between the word simple and the word familiar. Simple means that it is easy to use, and it doesn't have any unnecessary complexity in it. It gives you focus, and it doesn't burden you to do stuff you don't have to do. Familiar means you have looked at it so many times, you don't have to look at it again. And in this case, this is familiar because you have seen it so many times, but definitely it's far from being simple. In fact, I would argue this is one of the most complex code we can look at because if you look at this code, you had to first initialize the variable to an initial condition. Then you had to set the boundary condition. Then you had to say how to increment it. And setting the boundary condition, you have to be careful to make sure you don't step over and you are exactly on the value, whether it's a less than or less than or equal to, depending on what you're trying to do. That's a lot of effort to put in. And then once you get into the loop itself, you had to get the element from the loop calling the appropriate method. If it's a list you use, a get, if it's an array, use a square bracket. Look at all these variations. So these are all different moving parts you have to deal with. And so this is a lot of complexity built into this code. Well, thankfully, we have another way to reduce this complexity. And this is an external iterator also. And this is where for element in numbers, and then we can output the element. Well, clearly, this one is a lot better than the previous one, as you can can see because it takes a lot less effort to write this. But both of these collectively are called as external iterators because you still control the iteration all by yourself, asking it to go to the next element and the next element and the next element, and you have to work through all the details. Well, rather than doing all of that, we can thankfully switch over to an internal iterator. So what does an internal iterator do? Well, you're going to say numbers dot for each. Stop right there and take a look at what we have right now. Well, in this case, you have a for each, but notice you're calling the for each on the numbers. So rather than passing the collection to for, you are invoking the for each on the collection. Well, what is one benefit you get when you pass an object to a function versus you call a function on an object itself? Well, when you call a function on an object, you readily benefit from polymorphism. Well, remember what polymorphism tells us. You can tell what to do, but you can vary the implementation based on the actual type of the object. Well, in the first case, when you had the for loop, what is the for loop uh, on line number 7 or 8? And what does the for loop on line number 13 do? They do exactly what you tell them to do cause you pain and use sequential iteration. On the other hand, if you look at line number 18, what are you doing on line number 18? Well, you are asking it to iterate, but how is the iteration being done? Well, that we don't know. That's called polymorphism. The implementation detail can be hidden behind that function. We can vary it as much as we want to. So the point really here is we get the benefit of postponing 
owning the implementation and it could be sequential, it could be parallel, it could be lazy, what have you. So what I can do here is I can now say new uh, and in this uh, I'll uh, send to this one a little consumer of integer and in this we will simply say public void accept and integer let's say the value that I want to accept I don't want to print out the value. Well what in the world is this consumer that we are referring to? Well I'm going to bring in java.util.function.consumer that's the package in which the consumer exists. So we brought in the consumer right now and then we're going to ask him to iterate and then pass the value to this consumer over and over. So you can see that in this case we are using an internal iterator rather than using an external iterator. But I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, gosh, this is okay. This may be better. But in order to use this, if I have to use an anonymous inner class, heck no, I'm not going to be interested in this, right? This is a lot of noise, a lot of code, but we already saw how we don't have to write that much code. That part we already covered. So what I'm going to do is replace this noise. And again, notice, I'm going to take the noisy part, remove the noise from here, put a little arrow right there, and then remove the remainder of the noise from this code, and we reduce that to a single line of code without all those noise that we saw just a minute ago. So this shows you how Instead of using an external iterator, you can nicely use an internal iterator and remove all that noise from the code. Well, that definitely is a lot less code to write. And the beauty is we're not managing the iteration ourselves. Instead, we put the iteration on autopilot. We simply said, go iterate. And I don't care about how you iterate at this point. But here's what I want you to do for every single element in this collection. And you're done saying that. Well, that's great. So far, but there is still one small thing we can eliminate from this and take a look at the code for a minute, what we have on our hand. Well, if you notice the code we have right here, we said, take a collection of numbers and you're going to receive an integer called value and I want you to print the value. Well, but notice we said integer value. But where, where is this coming from? Coming from collection called numbers. But notice what the collection of numbers is. It's a collection of integers integers. Let's take a wild guess. If you iterate through a collection of integers, in your wildest imagination, can you guess what you would pull out of the collection if you take an element? A dog? Well, no, that would be cute to have some puppies, but I can bet you, you would never get a puppy out of a collection of integer, as cute as it would be, right? So you're going to get integers no matter how hard you try. So in other words, why say the most obvious detail? So one thing I've learned in life is never to say what's obvious. There is always exception to that rule. The only exception is when I wake up in the morning and I say I love you to my wife. That makes the list of the day much better, right? And that's pretty obvious, but just say it and the day gets better. Anything else that's obvious, I avoid it in my life, right? So don't say the obvious. Just get moving and get your work done. So the point really in this case is that Type is integer is absolutely obvious. You know it. Java knows it. Why bother? So I'm going to get rid of it. And for the first time in a long time, Java is finally intelligent. So in other words, Java can have, so Java 8 has type inference uh, finally and, you know, hold your tweets, um, uh, but only for, uh, you know, lambda expressions. So it's not for everything, just for lambda expressions. So the point really is Java doesn't go out and implement type inference for everything. That would be so cool if it did, but it just does it only for lambda lambda expressions alone. So when it comes to lambda expressions, you can leave out type information quite a bit. Not all 
the time, but most of the time. There are a few times when Java will get confused about the type, and you nudge it a little bit with the type information, it's more than happy. Uh, I've seen that maybe in 1% uh, of the case of the code I've written, I have to specify the type 99% of the time. Java is quite happy to really not have the type information. It can infer the type and be happy with it. Well, that's great so far. We don't have the type information at this point. That reduces the noise quite a bit. But we can go a step further even more. We can remove the silly parentheses because that's purely a noise. Why bother with it? Well, keep in mind though, no parenthes so parentheses, so parentheses uh, is optional, but only so but only for one parameter uh, lambdas. So in other words, if a lambda has uh, no parameter at all, you have to put an empty parenthesis. If a lambda has two parameters or three or more, you have to put uh, the parentheses around it. So that is required only for a single parameter. This is optional. You can be done with it. So it's kind of like the 80-20 rule. You're going to be you're doing that quite often. You don't have to put the parentheses around that for that purpose. Great. Now that we saw this, well, there's one other problem with this code as well. If you look at this code right here, notice what are we doing here? We are receiving a value and simply turning around and passing this value. There is absolutely nothing intelligent in that lambda itself. It's a simple pass through. So in other words, I could have done this. I could have doubled the value. I could have added a plus one, but the point is I didn't. So all I did was a simple pass through. It's like receiving a package and just passing that on without doing anything with it. And the more code you write like this, the more angrier you're gonna get over time saying, why am I writing that stupid code? All I'm doing is receiving something and passing it. What a waste of keystrokes. Well, one thing I know for sure is this. Java programmers never write stupid code. They always figure out and invent IDEs to vomit stupid code. So the next thing you know, people will be tweeting each other, hey, what's that ID shortcut you use to create this stupid code so I don't have to type it? Well, they knew this was coming. So they decided to eliminate this noise in the code. And when you first look at this, it may look a really odd to you or for your eyes, but over time it becomes actually much easier to work with code because it's very expressive. So what you can do in this case is, notice how the value is received here and simply passed over there you can simply remove that particular variable from both sides. So notice in this case, I received a value and I'm simply passing that value, so we removed it. Well, ideally it would be this, but unfortunately though, they wanted to make it abundantly clear to us that we are passing the function and not invoking the function. So you replace this with a double colon, which is a method reference syntax. So in this case, what we have done is we have replaced the lambda with a method reference to say, all my intention is to receive that value and simply pass that value <coughs> as an argument in this case. And I'm not really messing with it at all. Well, like I said, in the beginning, it may look a little strange to look at this code, but once you get comfortable with it, the code actually becomes a lot more expressive and you actually spend a lot of time, effort, and energy trying to read this code actually. Because when you come in, at the very first look, you immediately know for each element in the collection, all you're doing is you're printing stuff. So that becomes very easy to see what's going on rather than trying to analyze through the lambda to find out what the lambda is doing. Now, I want to also throw a, a, a quick word of caution here. One of the things I want to emphasize is um, while lambdas are really cute, uh, you know, keep them that way. So that's important for us because it is our responsibility to keep the lambdas really cute. So in other words, lambdas are not going to be fun if you write 
20 or 30 or 50 lines of code within a lambda expression. So things I would recommend not doing is, you know, putting multiple lines of code in a lambda. So for example, if you see something like given an element and then you open a curly bra bracket and then do several lines of code in here, and then of course, finally, you are completing. Well, there are a couple of things you would have to do. The minute you put a curly bracket, you got to put semicolons in code. Potentially, you would have to do a return depending on uh, may be needed, right? So in other words, the code becomes very, very noisy and ugly. There's a reason why the code becomes noisy and ugly. That's a way for, the, for them to tell us, don't do this. So it's a nice little you know, hint to say, does it really look uh, you know, ugly? Do you like it? No, well then don't do it. So you kind of roll it back to a single you know, a function and then simply call that function. So avoid the urge of writing uh, a large lambda expressions. That's something important. So don't start with the curly braces and put stuff into the lambda, uh, it's an anti-pattern. We definitely want to avoid that as much as we can. So what we saw here so far is how we can refactor into lambdas, but that's a good time for us to talk a little bit about method references. So what are method references? Method references are only useful in the simplest or the most trivial of the cases. And that is, you're receiving an argument uh, or a parameter, and you want to simply not alter it in any way, but pass through. That's the only case where a method reference is useful. If you ever want to do something with the argument you receive, whether you want to add something, double something, call a you know, function, take the result of that, and do something more with it, you cannot use a method reference. A method reference is only when you directly want to pass what you receive on to the next journey. And, and so that's basically, a method reference is probably the most ultimate glue code you can think about. Well, let's take a look at some examples of method references. You could be a parameter, could become an argument. You already saw this, but I want to reiterate this so that it is easier for us to think through this particular case just a little bit one more time. So let's go back to this example here. I can start with this for each, and I can say, given an element, in this case, I can say output, call print line, so print line and element, and you can see where this is simply a pass through. Now I can say dot for each, and system dot out, and then I can say print line, and I, you know, notice system dot out is actually an object. So you're actually calling the method print line, which is an instance method on this object. Sometimes we lose sight and we assume in our own minds that print line is static because we see this everywhere, but print line is not a static method. It's actually an instance method on system dot out. So here you're actually passing the parameter as an argument to another instance method where the target is already defined. The target in this case is system.out. That is the object on which you are calling the print line function. So you can see in this case how that code does the work really well. So that's an example of how you can use this as a argument to this other function and pass it out. Well, that's great so far, but you can also pass this as an argument to a static method as well. So for example, in this case, I can say that I have numbers dot for each. Well, in this case, let's say system dot out and we'll just do print line. But before I do this, I'm going to take this up and say, I want to call a function called a map where the function map says, given an input, and I want to, let's say, convert this to a string. I could say integer, let's say, dot to string. And I'm going to call, let's say, this value e over here. Well, in this case, you can see that I can actually call the to string method, or let's say string dot to string, and I'm going to pass that down to this function and, and, and pass it around. So how does, how, does, how does this work? Well, that obviously has to be on a stream. We'll talk about that a little later. So you can see in this case, I'm going to take the string, and I'm going to call this, well, is it a value of? Probably a value of. We'll find out. So the value of, which is a static method, I'm going to call that. Great. So you can see in this case, 
we are calling a static method called value of, and we are passing this value e to it. Well, what we can do here is, rather than doing that, we can simply say, well, again, notice e over here is the same as e over here. Remove those common parts. And what can we do now? Simply change it to a double quote, and you're able to pass that through. That's a method reference. Now, structurally, Line number 13 looks a lot like line number 9, but keep in mind, line 9 is a method reference to an instance method, whereas line 13 is an ins a reference to uh, uh, line uh, uh, 14, rather, or 13, is a reference to a static method. So this shows you how these two uh, are looking similar, but the, but the method is actually a different type of method. One is an instance, uh, the other is a static method. But in both cases, though, your parameter has gone in as an argument. And a method reference can do that as well pretty nicely. But even better, a method reference uh, can be used when your parameter needs to become a target as well. So let's look at an example of how that is going to work out. So in this case, I'm going to say numbers.stream. Well, here I'm going to call map, given an element, and I'm going to say e dot, let's say, uh, two string. So I'm going to call two string on the element. And then I'm going to say for each system dot out and a print line. So notice that what I've done in this particular example, my parameter has become a target to this particular function. In fact, I'm calling a function on that object. This is different from the previous cases where, in the previous cases, our parameter became an argument, whereas in this case, our parameter is becoming a target on which I'm calling the method. Well, sure, but I can still use a method reference in this case as well. So what I'm going to do here is simply say, hey, what is this really e? Well, e is an integer, so I'm going to take this as integer and colon colon, and now I can remove this part from here, and I can route that, well, almost. This is a, one of the cases where when the method actually is as part of both, it's going to give us trouble. So I'm going to work through this example just a little bit different to show illustrate this. So let's say in this case, I'm going to convert this to integer. And this is silly, but I'm going to take the integer uh, a string, and I'm calling to string on it one more time. So in this case, of course, what I can do here is, this I know is clearly a string at this point, not an integer. So what am I going to do? I'm going to take this guy here and say string colon colon, and then I'm going to simply pass that to a two string. And notice what we just did here. What I did was, in fact, let me go ahead and make this a little bit more sensible. I'm going to say this is going to be, um, well, actually, we could call a value of, so let's do that. So string dot value of, that way you don't see two string twice and, you know, confused. So you can see in this case, uh, what I did a minute ago, let me make sure that code works still, and you can see that's working. So now I'm going to replace this with a, uh, with a method reference. So what did I do? Well, notice in this case, E is used as a target, and as a result, I want you to closely look at line number 13 and line number 19. Line 13 and line 19 have exactly the same format. But you have to know that on line 13, value of is a static method, whereas on line number 18 or 19, the method is actually a instance method. So the syntax is going to look about the same, whether you're calling a static method or a instance method, but based on the context, you have to know what you're dealing with and be able to work through it. So, so that may be a little confusing in the beginning, but once you, there are two things you're going to have a ben, as a benefit over time. One is you're going to get comfortable with it. And then the second thing is, 
Based on the context, you often know whether a function is a static method or an instance method because you work with the library so often. So that will resolve it very quickly in your mind as well. So, so method references are something that I found to be a bit painful in the beginning, but they become fairly easy to work with as time goes on. So this is a pain that kind of reduces over time. So, so that's actually a good news. And it becomes actually beneficial as well. You get more comfortable. You get better in using it as well. So this shows to you how we can use that as, uh, you know, nicely in this case, you can use that as, um, as a way to, uh, put, you know, uh, use as a method reference. So this shows you the method reference benefit and how you're able to use this as a method reference. So that's one thing you're seeing here in this particular case. So that's, that's pretty good. And um, so uh, I want to show you one other thing here. How do you go about using this one as uh, not just, a, you know, what if you have two arguments? Instead of having one argument, uh, what are you going to do uh, with that? Well, that could become a little bit of a problem because you don't have one parameter. Because when you had a one parameter, you nicely were able to decide whether that should be an argument or that should be a target. Life is very easy. But the problem is, how do you really deal with it when you have two parameters? You know. Let's go, go ahead, let's talk about that in a minute. And I just realized that I actually forgot to check in this code for you. So let me go ahead and check this in. So these are the refactoring the iterators. So, uh, so from external to internal iterators. So there we go. I've saved that. So now that we saw how we can do that, Let's talk about, continue to talk about method references right here. So what I'm going to do in this case is I'm going to show you one other method reference, which is really showing how powerful method references can actually be. So let's get to a next level here. Well, there, there can be two parameters coming in as an argument. So to understand this, let's continue here and say numbers.stream. But this time, I'm going to call reduce. And the reduce function says, given a carryover, we'll say total, comma element, I want to call integer.sum a total plus element. So if you notice in this case, all I'm going to do is simply total these values. And when I'm done, I want to output that. So we'll go ahead and say output. So in this case, you can see we are taking the total value and we're going to print out the value. So we got the stream. We call a reduce function. And the reduce function says, I'm going to take uh, two parameters. The first parameter is a 0 to indicate that it's an initial value. The second parameter is our lambda expression. And what does this lambda expression actually do? This lambda expression says, I'm going to take a value total and an element. And I'm going to call the sum function on integer, pass the total, and pass the element to it, and get that totaled up and return the result. Well, if you look at this, you got two parameters coming in. But notice both the parameters are really arguments. So again, you can see how they just pass through. Keep in mind one thing. The order is very important. If you had said e comma total, now clearly sum doesn't care. But other functions may not be that gentle. The order of the parameters may actually be very important. So if the order is not the same, you cannot apply method references. Method references are only value, uh, useful when the order is the same. You receive the parameter in that order. You pass in the same order. You cannot flip it. So, so keep that in mind. So notice I pass total and e right there to this function. Well, rather than doing that, what I can do is I can simply say, given this reduce, once more, notice I grab what's common on both sides, remove the common, replace that with a double colon, and that becomes a method reference rather than using uh, the actual method itself. So you can also use method references when you have two arguments as well. So that becomes really uh, useful. 
However, that's not the limit of this. You can do a little bit more with this. So let's look at one more example of this. Let's say we have numbers.stream, and I'm going to do a map, and I say, given a value, string.value of e, well, let's say string, in this case, uh, colon, colon, value of. Well, great. Now I got a bunch of strings. Now I'm going to call reduce. But this time I start with the empty, and I'm going to say, you know, let's call it as carry comma stir, and I'm going to call stir dot, well, in this case, carry dot concat uh, stir. Again, keep in mind the order makes a difference. So let's output the result from here as well. So in this example, if you notice, what did I do? I have taken this and called the concat method on this to concatenate the values together. But did you notice a difference between this and the previous example? In this example, I got two parameters still for the reduce, but the first parameter is a target Whereas the second parameter is actually an argument. Unlike the previous one where both the parameters became the arguments. So in this case, I can still use method references as well. And the way I'm going to do that is simply again, here is carry and stir. Again, notice the order is the same. So I'm going to remove those two. And I'm going to replace this with string concat and use the instance method and you can do that as well. So you can see how really powerful method references are. In You can use them when they are parameters going to arguments, parameters going to target, using static methods, using instance methods, two parameters, and then you can carry them over and you can keep going like this. Of course, the question is, are there limitations? There are two limitations when it comes to um, method references. One, you cannot use them if you are doing any manipulation of the data. And second, you cannot use them if there is a conflict between a instance method and a static method. So in other words, when the compiler tries to substitute this with the method, if it finds there is one method it can use, it's happy. If it finds there are two methods potentially that are candidates, it's going to give you an error and say, I'm sorry, I cannot use it. That's why you saw me getting an error for the toString method, because integer toString is actually both a static method and an instance method is complaining because of that. There are a few workarounds, but keep in mind in general, that it's going to give you an error when there is an ambiguity with these functions. So let me remember to uh, save this away. Uh, these are different ways of using method references. So we'll say method uh, method references, uh, you know, uh, different options. So we saw quite a variety of options available for method references and how we can use them. Well, that's great, but I want to really look at two more things before we hit the break. Uh, uh, so first thing I want to talk about is function composition. And the second thing I want to talk about is how we can actually take this to the next uh, level of detail, how we can actually benefit from this as well to do something even better. So let's look at one other example here. Well, we already saw this quite a bit. But let's look at one other example just to reiterate this particular idea. Let's say I'm going to say, uh, given the values, uh, double the even numbers and total. So I want to double the even numbers and total the numbers. How am I going to write the code for that? Well, we can write imperative style code for it. And then we can write the functional code and let's kind of compare them. So I'll say result is equal to zero, output the result. Well, what am I going to do? I'm going to say for int element coming from numbers. And in this case, I'm going to say if element mod 2 is equal to zero, and then what am I going to say? Well, I know this is the even number. Well, then I can say uh, result is plus equal to e times 2, and this is a double of even numbers in the collection. Well, if you look at the code right here, you while the code is doing the job, there is quite a few problems in this code. First thing is, it lacks clarity. Now, you have been told we shouldn't write spaghetti code. And we all can agree we shouldn't write spaghetti code. What is wrong with spaghetti code? We got code doing things everywhere, and it becomes really hard to untangle and understand it. 
But here is what I learned. We've been doing spaghetti code, we just don't admit to doing it, right? So if you really look at the code I've highlighted, isn't that a spaghetti code if you really think about it? Notice how intertwined things are and we kind of go back and forth doing stuff and there is no real clarity in the code and yet we kind of take a deep breath and we write code. Now, this is one thing we always do, right? When we program, what do programmers do? Programmers have to deeply think about code. Why do we have to deeply think about code? Because it's often so messed up. We have to deeply think about it, right? And you hold all that logic in your head and you have everything is kind of barely holding together in your head. And if somebody talks to you, you get very angry because they completely disrupted the model, right? You know what I'm talking about, right? Because you probably remember this day, you're sitting and working at your home or office and you're deeply working on this code and somebody comes and interrupts you asking questions like, you know, have you had lunch? And you just stare at them like something was poked in your eyes or something, right? And then they say, are you okay? You say, no, I'm not okay. Look at what you did. You completely disrupted a model and you start putting this back together. And they look at us and they are weird and they walk away, right? Well, there's a reason why programmers are weird. There's a reason why we are so antisocial because we got to think and hold these stuff in our head, right? And when you're, when you're in the train, what do you do? You build that code model in your head and the last thing anybody you want to do is ask you a question like leave me alone I have this I can take this all the way to the office and write this in code right now so we do all of this in our head and it's a burden we have to only programmers will ever understand this right I mean anytime you know I'm gonna, I'm, I travel a lot so I'm always in flights or trains or airplanes and you would you would find me as the quiet quietest person in the world because the first thing I do when I sit down is check the person next you know, next to me. If the person is a programmer, we, will, we are a riot. We'll bring the flight down with our noise. But if the other person is not a programmer, I, I don't care. Leave me alone. I've got work to do, right? And, and only geeks understand this. And, and other people think that we are antisocial, but we really are not. We are absolutely social with the right kind of people, right? So the point really is that, that we have all this built... Yeah, thank you. So, so the po point really is we build all of that in our heads and, and and that's a burden we can ease a little bit at least when it comes to writing this code where it doesn't have to be intertwined so so you know intertwined with the logic so create this variable first then get the variable e then check if it is even then double it add it right away then go back wait a minute why am i going back well that is spaghetti right so i want this to be very logical very nice flowing how do i do that well here's the idea i'm going to say number dot stream well think of a stream as a very nice fancy iterator so we're kind of easing into stream right here so think of a stream as a very nice fancy iterator this iterator well iterators in Java give us the next element and the next element and the next element well stream has a wealth of functions we can use the very first function I'm going to use is a function called filter well stop right there for a minute why am I calling in filter well, look at what we've been doing. Here is a challenge for you. Um, when you get back to your uh, code, quickly do a grep and look for the number of times you use for in your code. We are using for way far too many times. And we got for spilled everywhere in the code. So how does this feel? This feels like you hear a knock on the door you open the door and there's a guy standing there with a hammer. And you look at this guy and say, who are you? He says, you guys called to fix your kitchen? You say, yeah. Don't you have any tools with you? And the guy takes a whack at your door and says, I don't need any stinking tool. I've got a hammer. What do you do? You would let the person in and run out and call the cops because it's not safe to be in house anymore, right? Well, this is called a four hammer. And we've been using this four hammer way too long in our code. But 
Then you hear this door doorbell ring. You open the door. There's a guy with a little bag and he says, I'm here to fix your kitchen. You say, come on in. And what does this person do? Lays the bag on the kitchen counter, takes the tools out. And what are the tools? There's a hammer, sure. But there is a little spanner, a little screwdriver, a little wrench, and so many little chisel. And you look at this and say, hey, cute little tools. Oh yeah, these are the tools of my trade. And you ask the person, wow, are you going to use all of those tools? And what does the person say? He laughs and says, no, I'm not going to use all those tools because the person who uses all the tools is called a consultant. Well, I'm not going to use all of those tools. I'm going to only use tools that make sense. Well, that little tool is called the filter tool. So we use a little tool called filter. What does the filter tool say? The filter tool says, given an element, element mark 2 is equal to 0, it says only give me the even numbers and block everything else. Great. Now the next thing we do is map given an element, element times 2, that's awesome, we double the values. Well, reduce it starting with 0, integer colon colon sum, and we are asking him to give us the sum of the values in this collection, even numbers doubled. Now if you look at this code right here, notice what the code does, produces the same result. However, there is one big difference. It's no longer a spaghetti code. Look at the single pass through. Given a collection, filter the values, double them, and reduce it. We can even do this a little bit better. We can say, in this case, map to int, and we can replace this with sum, even better. So now you can see how even more expressive the code is. But if you look at this code, what's the difference between the two pieces of code? Now here is something you can do. You can look at this code and you can say, hey, here is a piece of code. What does the code do? And I give you a challenge. Write a code like this, put it in front of the, the programmer, but sit in front of the programmer and watch their eyeballs when they look at this code. It's going to do this. It's going to start here and do this, right? Go up and down, up and down, up and down, and then it comes like this. And then this point is called the point of confusion. You're like, um, hmm. Right? So that's what we do. We analyze back and forth through the spaghetti code. But look at the code on the bottom. It's a single pass through. Given the collection, get me even numbers, double them, total. So that becomes a lot easier to read, a lot easier to understand. It's much more expressive when you write code like this. So what are we dealing with here? This is called function composition. So function composition is where you are composing this as a series of operations. Sometimes you want to call this as a pipeline, if you want to call it as a pipeline. So notice how you take the stream of data, send it through a filter, and then through a mapping, and then you come to a sum. Of course, we want to know what the performance of these things are, and we will do that in the next part. But the point really here is how this is flowing through as a pipeline and getting the result. So we can do single pass analysis, and the code becomes easier to read, easy to understand. Did you also notice one more thing? I wrote these in multiple lines, uh, as you saw a minute ago. I could have written it like this. I actually see programmers who try to write like this, and I tell them, don't do this. Now, why shouldn't we write code like this? Because if you notice, that code works too. But if you write the code like this, it's very easy to see the flow, the composition. If you write the code uh, like this one, it is really hard to see where one function ends and the next one starts. This takes more effort. So the other day somebody asked me, is there a time when we should write code like this? There is actually one time when you should write code like this. It, that is if you hate everybody that you work with, right? Otherwise, don't ever write code like this because it's not going to help anybody. So you always must really write the code in a way that every single line is cohesive, focused, and does one thing and one thing well. In fact, there are IDEs today where the IDE will format the code like this. So you can use your shortcut 
to say reformat the code and it would format it automatically like this. Make sure that you have set the Java 8 settings so that it does the formatting like this and, and, and emphasize that your team never puts two dots on the same line because it becomes really hard to read the code. So lining up the dots is extremely helpful to keep the flow, the composition in our mind that can help us quite a bit. So what I showed you is the function composition, uh, some of the things we can do with parallelization. And, and for the benefit of time, I'm going to cut short a little bit and, and, and use a different example than I had in, in my mind originally, but that's okay. So let's look at this quickly to understand how this can help us. So we saw a little example here of how we are running through. There are uh, quite a few things we can actually do. Imagine for a minute that these examples were extremely trivial and simple, uh, you know, finding if it's even doubling. Those don't take much time at all. But, but you could think of very complex problems to solve, like uh, meaning of life. Okay, not, maybe not that complex. Um, maybe uh, something that's going to require quite a deep amount of computation, something that's time consuming. So let's say in this case, I'm going to write a function called compute, and I'm going to pass the value e to it. So in this case, I'm going to say public static int compute, and I've got the number coming in here, and I'm going to simply say return uh, number, uh, let's say time two, but assume that this is assume uh, this is time intensive. Uh, so this is going to take a lot of time to run. Let's assume that. Well, in this case, of course, uh, we could have used uh, our uh, method references as well. That's really doesn't matter really which one we do. But the point really is we have this code running right here. But how much time does this code uh, go, you know, is going to take to run? Well, it's going to be as many elements we have times the amount of time it takes for each element in this particular computation. So that's pretty simple, pretty straightforward to see at this point. Uh, let's quickly look for the time information. I'm going to bring in one more class here for that purpose, and then uh, I will uh, use that one here. So I've got a little code here called time, uh, time it, uh, dot Java. Let's take a look at uh, what time it does. So if you look at time it, all I'm doing is I'm taking a runnable, measuring the time around it, and just printing how much time it took. Nothing really big deal. And again, it's a very approximate measurement, not, not something elaborate or perfect. So what am I going to do? Time it and uh, a dot code. And in this case, I'm going to take this particular uh, uh, code that I'm interested in uh, working through, which is just this one line of code, and I'm going to run through that and see how much time that code is going to take to uh, run. Well, in this particular case, I've got a, a, a little code coming in. Let's make sure that I've done this right. So um, the code is going to measure the time duration for that piece of code I have within here to execute. All that it's doing, it's taking a runnable and working through it. So um, this guy is a static method called code, and that's a runnable coming through. Let's see what's, what's going on here. OK, so this is done sequentially, as you can see. So I'm taking a stream filtering elements, mapping them, and then uh, totaling them. That, that's my result. All right. So when I run this, let's see, uh, time it uh, could not find uh, or locate the sample. So I'm not sure why it's complaining about that. Let me actually look for the uh, time it class. That seems, oh, of course, eh, little typo, sorry. So right there is our little time it. So that says it took uh, you know, that much time. But let's delay this so we can actually see the time. So try, let's say, um, this is going to be uh, thread.sleep. Uh, and uh, in this case, I'm going to give, oh, a second for each of these to run. So catch exception. And uh, given this, um, it's going to take, we got about 10 elements. So about 10 seconds to run is reasonable to expect. So clearly, uh, but I only have even numbers looked at, so drop off half of them, five seconds, makes sense. OK, but I can then go back here and say a parallel stream. And in this case, you can see we are unleashing multiple threads on this. And it gave you the same result, but it took a lot less time, in this case, one second rather than five seconds. So a stream, while a stream is taking about five seconds to run, you can see that when we engage the parallel stream, it takes only about a second to run, as you can see. Well, 
having said that, be extremely careful with parallel stream. So um, I'm going to actually leave this here with the stream and a parallel stream, so you can actually see both of those. And uh, But let's talk about this a little bit before we uh, go any further. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. I'll save this as parallel stream. A um, couple of things to think about. First, just because you can parallelize doesn't mean you should parallelize. There are enormous things we have to go through to make sure we are parallelizing for the right reason. So think of a parallel stream as like having a bulldozer. Just because, because you have one doesn't mean you have to use it. And you've got to be very careful where you use it. Mowing a lawn with a bulldozer is not a good idea usually. Things like that. So the point really is, a parallel stream simply says, I do not mind using a lot of threads and a lot of resources so I can get the answer faster. So here is an example of what that means. So imagine for a minute, I don't know where I put my phone, I don't remember, because I was sitting in one of these seats before, and I want to know where the phone is. Well, here's something I could do. I could start with the first gentleman. I could say, could you please see if my phone is next to you? Next person, could you please see? I could keep going this way, and maybe the fifth person I come to, he says, yep, your phone is here. Oh yeah, I remember now I was sitting over there. Thank you for finding the phone. What was the cost? I had to ask five people to search. It took five units of time, where one unit is time spent on one person searching. So five units of time, five people, uh, resource wasted, and then I got the result. Or I can simply say, hey folks in this room, I don't know where I left my phone, could you all please check if it's next to you? Well, everybody is going to quit what they are doing and search for it. And he exactly finds the result again, what's the unit of work spent? As many people in this room as we have, that's how much unit of work that was spent. How much time it took? One unit of time. I got it faster this time, but I employed a lot more resource to get the answer faster. That is something we have to be very careful about. You must be willing to waste or spend or expend more effort and, and resource to get the answer faster. So use parallel stream when A, it makes sense to use it. Meaning the problem on hand is actually parallelizable. B, when you are willing to spend a lot more resource to get the answer faster. C, when the data size is big enough, you will get a benefit in performance. D, when the task computation is big enough, that will get a benefit in performance. So just because you parallelize doesn't mean you will always get better performance. You got to make sure you actually do. So make sure the answer is correct, make sure the performance is good, and make sure that you are willing to use so much resource to get the answer uh, back. So that's all I'm going to talk about parallel stream itself, but I want to switch back to talking about streams. So lambdas are really cool. But streams are really awesome. This is where the real power in uh, uh, Java 8 is, is really in streams. When I was writing the Java 8 book, I wrote something in the book, and uh, my editor called me on the phone and, and she said, hey, Venkat, I'm reading this chapter, and you got to send a you know, paragraph here, and I really am not sure if you write something like this in the book. When I replied, I replied to her saying, but you don't realize where I live. I live in the state of Colorado, I said. And then she thought for a second and said, OK, you can write. And then she hung up. Well, what did I write in the book? Well, if you've been keeping up with what happens in Colorado, you probably know this. And what I wrote in the book was that lambdas are the gateway drug. Streams are the real addiction. Not that I have personal experience with addiction in Colorado, but the point really is that lambdas are the gateway drug. It kind of lures you in. But what you're going to be staying there for really is streams. I remember clearly being very lukewarm about Java 8. I'm like, eh, I'm not sure I'm excited about this. I was going through lambdas, playing with it. And I remember that day when I stepped into streams and I was like, whoa, wait a minute. This is something different. I was not expecting this. And I was hooked on to Java 8 at that minute. And, and so to me, what really drew me into Java 8 was lambdas. It brought in the curiosity. But what really got me excited about Java 8 was really the streams. But why so? The first thing is, streams are an abstraction. So what does it mean a stream is an abstraction? Well, a stream is not a physical object with data. 
A set is a data, a list is a data, a map is a data, a collection of data, but a stream is not. A stream is a bunch of functions you would evaluate eventually. There is no data sitting in a stream. So a stream, unlike a list or a set, is not what you can point out and say, here is the data in the, in the, in the list, here is the data in the, in the set. Well, you cannot point to data in the stream, it doesn't exist. So it's a purely an abstraction. It is a non-mutating pipeline. So what that means is, you have this function composition, so think of the function composition as that pipeline of transformations, and as the data flows through that pipeline of transformation, you are asking it to transform from one to the next to the next, but you're not ever mutating any of the uh, values or collections, especially one thing you definitely avoid is shared mutability. That is something you got to be very careful about, not to change things in a shared context. So uh, that's another thing to think about. So quickly, let's talk about a few functions that belong to a stream. Well, these are very common functions in a stream. The first is a filter operation. So what does a filter do? A filter says, I'm going to take the value in a stream and block some and let some go through. So in other words, if I have a collection of numbers on my hand like you see up here, and I'm going to ask it to perform in this case, let's say numbers.stream, and I say dot .filter, given an element, element mod 2 is equal to 0. So what does this do? It's going to block non-even numbers from going through, and it's going to let even numbers go through. So in terms of a filter, there are a few things we need to understand. The first thing about filter is 0 uh, less than or equal to number of elements uh, in the output. So uh, elements in the output. And uh, this, of course, is less than or equal to number of elements in the input. So essentially, what you have in the case of um, a number of input, let's say number of input. Um, so what essentially is happening in this case is um, the filter will either block everything. For example, if I say, here's a room with very wonderful people. I, if I say, stand up if you are older than 200 years old, I hope nobody is standing up, right? So the point is there's nobody in this room who is older than 200 years, and as a result, that's a, that's a zero as the output. Or if I say, stand up if you're older than six months, uh, everybody here is going to stand up. So the point really is, it could be everybody or nobody, or usually somebody in between. If I say, stand up if you're older than 30, some folks are going to stand up, others are going to sit down. So that's in between the size. So that's one thing. Second thing about filter is uh, input. What's the kind of input it's going to take? So a stream t filter uh, takes predicate, so predicate uh, t. So when you have a stream of type t, the filter function is going to take a a predicate of type t. So remember, lambdas are backed by interfaces, functional interfaces. Well, this one is a predicate interface it's going to take. So that's basically what a filter does. Now, also one other thing, we'll talk about evaluation, uh, how it's going to evaluate later on. Let's talk next about the map function. Map is a transforming function. So map transforms uh, values. So in this case, what's the map going to do? So given a map, the number of number of output is equal to the number of input. So you're going to have exactly the same number. So we have a room full of people. If I say I want everybody's name, the number of names I'm going to have is equal to the number of people. But there's no one thing that is different though. No guarantee on the type of the output with respect to the type of the input. So in other words, input type and output type can be very different. In, in what way? So in the case of a map, so um, a map, so input, the map is going to take, so actually I should say this is the argument or parameter rather than input. So we'll say this is parameter. So parameter, 
a stream t map takes a function t comma r to return stream of type r. So that is basically how a map works. A map says, I am going to receive as the parameter a function that will take a value from the collection coming in and return a value into the, into the stream that's going out. So in other words, it's a transformation function of input stream going to output stream. So when I have values coming in, I'm going to apply the mapping function. I'm going to get the output going forward from it. So that's a transformation operation. Like, for example, I could double each of the values. So in this case, I can say map given an element, element times 2. Well, the type coming in is integers. The type going out is integer. I could have also said dot 0. In that case, the type coming in is integer stream. Type going out will be double stream. So I can perform the transformation of the types as well if I chose to do the transformation at this point. Well, but I want to emphasize one thing about both filter and uh, map. So both the filter, so both filter and map uh, stay within their swim lanes. Uh, I'm, I'm going to explain what that means by, uh, by that. So let's say for a minute, you have uh, values in your collection. Let's say the values you have are x1, let's say x2, x3, x4. Well, I can apply a filter. So the filter function is going to block a certain value, or it's going to let go a value, maybe block another value, and maybe let go another value. But if you look at this, they pretty much are minding their own business, meaning they stay within their swim lanes. So if you think of these as swim lanes, filter is only keeping within its swim lane. So filter says, I'll take an element, I'll move it forward or block it. In this element, I'll move it forward or block it. It never looks for element to the sides, left or right. It keeps focus on its own swim lane. That's what it cares about. Likewise, a map is going to perform a transformation. So this has been blocked, but this one, I will say x, you know, x2 prime, and this is going to become x4 prime. That's a transformation operation. Once again, you are in the swim lane. You take an element and you transform it. You're not looking for what's on the left. You're not looking for what's on the right. So if I come to you and say, what's your name? You're going to say what your name is. I hope you don't look around to see who is nearby, so you change your name, right? So you focus on yourself, so you always keep it to yourself, and you're focused on your swim lane. Well, all the changes when it comes to reduce. So what does reduce do? Reduce cuts across, so cuts across the swim lanes. So reduce is wicked. Reduce says, I'm going to start here, and I'm going to swim this way. Cutting across the swim lane. So in this case, let's look at an example of reduce. I'm going to take this and say dot reduce, and I'm going to take a 0.0, .0 take a carry and an element, and return a carry plus an element. Let's just print this out first before we look at the details of what a reduce is going to do. So let's go ahead and run that. It gave us a 60. Well, because I took the reduce and I went through this. But how does this work? Well, the reduce says, I'm going to take an initial value coming in. Well, what's my initial value? So let's go ahead and say reduce. So the reduce says, I'm going to take an initial value. Well, what's my initial value? Well, 0.0, .0 is my initial value. Why? Because that's what I gave here. And the reduce says, I'm going to take that one. So that's the value coming in. So that's coming in. Takes the value that is the first element in this case, which is available. So that's the value coming in. Does the operation, whatever that operation is, plus or whatever you may want to think about, and what does that do? Produces a result for that particular computation. So that result goes down the lane right here and continues down further, as you can see right here, comes down all the way. And then he says, I'm going to take the next value right here, perform the operation on it, produce the next result from it, 
and then I'm going to keep going like this. So if you notice how this guy behaves compared to the other one, this one is cutting across the swim lane. So it starts with this, takes the first value, performs the operation, comes down, takes the next one, performs the operation, and goes down. So it is going down like this across the swim lane rather than sticking to it. Here is another way to think about it. If you want to think about it a little differently, suppose I had a value, let's say, a 1, and I have a value 2, and I have a value 3, and a value 4. And let's say I want to perform a product operation, not just a plus. So to do the product, I take a 1. I perform a product of 1 and this 1 right here. That produces a result over here, and that's going to be a 1. I take the result of 1, perform a product again of that 1 and this 2, and that's going to produce a result at this point, and that result is going to become a 2. Then I go further, take the result of that, perform a product again. That goes, is going to give me a 6 because I'm going to take this 3 and the 2 and perform a product at this point. And you can see how that's going to bring in. And then, of course, once I have that value, I'm going to take that one and this value 4 right here, perform the next product operation, and I'm going to give you a result of 24 outside of that. So you can see how this is working. So here's a way to think about it. You take the reduce, you are taking an input coming in, you take the first element, perform your operation, push the result out, there's the result, you step forward, that result becomes your input again, take the next result, perform the operation, push the result out, then the next one. So this is kind of marching along where it's taking the input, churning it through the result, producing the output, and there's a feedback, right? That comes back right through. So every step of the way, that becomes a feedback. So the very initial value is the first value. The result becomes the feedback into the next op. That result becomes a feedback into the next op. That result becomes a feedback into the next op, and so on. So you can see how that's moving forward in creating the result of this, and that gives you the result moving forward. But what does the, what does the reduce actually work with? Reduce swims across the swim lanes, like I said. And so what does the reduce take? Reduce on stream t takes, uh, takes um, two parameters. The first parameter, so first parameter, so first parameter is of type T. And then, of course, the second parameter is of type, well, this is actually a by function of some type R and T returning R to produce a result of R. So that's a little bit more overloaded. But if you really think about this, let's relate back to what we did so far in this example. So if you notice, this is a reduce being called on a stream coming in, that's a stream of double. So carry is a double, that is a double, and the result is a double. So in this case, it's all of them are double. So it is really decided by, this is the element type, this is the input type, that's the output type. If you relate this to what we did here, this is the element, so that is the middle guy T, that's this guy here up here, elements coming in. R is the input and the output type. Why? Because the input for one stage is, the, the output of one stage is the input of the next stage, which in turn becomes the input of the next stage and so on. And then you can see that being, you know, feeding through, that's basically what this is doing. So this gives you an idea about these different functions. But there are some very specialized reduce functions as well. For example, like sum, if you will. So rather than doing all of this, we could have also done the following. We could have said, given these values, we can take these and say, well, this is map over here. Uh, let's say uh, map to double. And then I can specify, in this case, a map to double and replace all of this with simply a sum. That's because a double stream has the value also. That's a very specialized reduce operation. When you look at the word sum, you should be very comfortable to say that's a reduce operation. So what is a reduce operation? I'm going to say three things about reduce. Reduce cuts across swim lane. 
So reduce brings values together, whereas filter and map only move values forward or transform them. On the other hand, a reduce cuts across a swim lane. Second, a reduce may transform a collection into a single value, potentially, or it may transform it to a non-stream and to a concrete type, that is. In the examples you saw so far, uh, it is only reducing to a single value. So I'll save this away, stream, let's say stream common operations. Great. Now that I saved that away, Let's talk about one other very specialized collect, uh, uh, reduce operation, which is called a collect. Well, in order to understand collect, I'm going to change this example just a little bit. So I'm going to take this collection one through five, and then I'm going to repeat it one more time as one through five again. So I, you can see that there are values that are duplicates. So I'm going to say over here, numbers.stream, and I will say in this case, uh, let's say first of all, how do I do a, put into a list? So let's go uh, do one thing a little different. In this case, I'm going to simply say uh, double the values, that's the first thing I'm going to do, and put that into a list. Well, let's say double the even values and put that into a list. I'm going to show you a wrong way to do this. Uh, why am I showing the wrong way? Very simple. I see people do this every single week. So next time you see this, you can change one other programmer and say, don't do this. So wrong way to do this. First of all, list integer uh, double of even equals new array list. So I'm creating an empty list. For int element coming from numbers, if L, well, actually, you know what? There's a better way to do this, right? So numbers.stream dot, let's say, filter, given an element, element mark two is equal to zero. And you look at this code and say, awesome, this is wonderful. So, so far, so good. Then you say map, given an element, element times two. Things are going so well so far. Then you see for each. Then they say, given an element, Double of even dot or add element. And then when you're done with it, output double of even. Uh, before I go any further, I'll put don't do this. That way people don't take a photo and post it and then celebrate it, right? Okay, so what is so wrong in this code? What did I do wrong? Mutate. mutate. Actually, I did something more than mutate, you're right. So mutability is okay. Sharing is nice. Shared mutability is devil's work, right? So another thing to keep in mind, this is very important life lesson. Friends don't let friends do shared mutation, right? So you should never allow anybody, right? If you ever see a brother or sister doing shared mutability, take them up alone and say, we shouldn't do this, right? Coach them to say you should never do this. This is evil thing to do. Now, what is wrong with this? Well, what's wrong with this is we are doing a shared immutability, which means you are going to be potentially running this in a in a in a parallel stream, and multiple streams, multiple uh, code threads try to go change this variable at the same time. Potentially, we may lose some data uh, doing this. We got concurrency problems, race conditions. So this is evil. Don't do this. Well, thankfully, there's a better way to do this. A better way to do this would be to bring in what is called a collector. So static over here dot stream dot collectors. So we'll bring in the collectors. Now, notice what I'm going to do in this case. I'm going to say output. Well, the first thing here, well, actually, let's put it in the list first of all. So I'm going to bring in the list of double of even. So good, this one is of even uh, two equals. And I'm going to say numbers.stream dot filter, just like we did before, mark two is equal to zero. And then we do the map element, and I'm going to say element times two. Then we say collect over here to list. And you can see in this case, we are putting it to a list and finally, we could specify as an output 
the double of even two. So you can see in this case, you are able to uh, do the same work. But the difference in this example is, you can see how we used a collect function, and that takes care of threat safety for you automatically. So you want to avoid shared immutability as much as you can. So never do shared immutability. It is something very, very careful. So notice this is actually a shared variable outside, and you should not change the shared variable. That's very important. So I'll save it here as avoid shared mutability. And we are using a collect, but what in the world is collect? Collect is a reduce operation as well. So what we did in this case is we used a to list function, which made our lives a lot easier. So you can see in this case, we simply took the to list and convert it to, a, to a, the, the stream into a list and put it. Well, that's a result of using the to list. I'll save it here as to list. Now, a couple of things to keep in mind. We are in a stream, remember stream is an abstraction, but from a stream we get down to a, to a concrete collection, which is a list. When I run this code, notice I got a 4848. Why? Because we took only even numbers and we doubled them, so we got 48 and 48. But if I change this to a two set, notice in this case, obviously it's a set and not a list, so I change it to a set. So now you can see there's only 48, because sets do not permit duplication. So you don't have 4848, you only got 48. So that gives you an idea about how you can put it into a two set rather than into a list. But you can also do something uh, even more interesting with this. Well, you got all these values coming through, but what if you really wanted to uh, create, let's say, a map of values that you wanted to create? How do you go about creating uh, a map? Well. To understand how to create a map, I'm going to de uh, deviate from this example, but I'm going to take, uh, take a, a slightly different example here of working with a person class, and I'm going to play with a little person a class to uh, provide a better way to work with this. So let's take, uh, take a slightly different example and work with it to see the power we have on some of these concepts. I got a little function here called create, and the create is going to create a bunch of people for us. So you can see create people has a bunch of people, some people with the same name, some people with the same age, some people with the same gender. Great. So I got to create people. So I'm going to say list of person. And I'm going to say here is people equals create people. And what do I want to do? Well, I've got a bunch of Sarah's and, and Jack. But let's say the problem is the following. Uh, create a map with name and age as key and peep the person as value. Well, in this example, name and age actually is unique. So you want to come up with something that is unique because maps key cannot be duplicates. And then I want a person as a value. Well, if I were to ask you to write this code in imperative style, you would loop through and try to mess with things, but you don't have to work that hard. So notice what I'm going to do here. People over here, the collection dot stream. So we'll start with the stream of that. And then I'm going to say dot collect to map. Well, we're almost there. So we we're asking it to create a map of the result for us. So that's good. But what should I tell the map? Well, I got to tell him what the keys are and the what the values are. So the first thing I'm going to say is for the key value, given a person, person get name plus, let's put a little dash, plus person dot get age. So I've told how to create a key, first of all. So the very first function you pass to the to map function is a lambda that transforms the object to key values. The second one is going to be given a person, just giving back the person. I don't need to do anything more with it. So in this case, what I did is I created a map where my map contains name and age as key, and the value is a person itself. So not only can you create a list or a set from a stream, you can create a map as well very easily, as you can see in this case. 
So I'll save this away as a two map over here. But the beauty is you can quickly go very further into this for creating groups of objects as well. So let's look at an example of how we can perform a grouping. Now I want you to go through this exercise mentally for a minute. Then we can see how we would do this in a, in a much more easier way. So given a list of people, create a map where their name is the key and value is all the people, uh, people with, let's say, that name. So in other words, let's think through how we will be doing this. So first, you create an empty map. Then you go take the list. Take the first element in the list. It's a person. Get the name of the person. Hey, what's your name? Oh, I'm Sarah. Hang on a second, Sarah. Does Sarah exist as a key in the map? No, she doesn't. Okay, create an empty list. Add Sarah object to that empty list. Then do a put on the map where put name is Sarah, object is the list we created. Get the second person. Hey, what's your name? I'm Sarah. Oh, hi, Sarah. Hang on a second. Do we have Sarah in the list? We do. Get the value for the key Sarah. Here's a list. Take this particular object, add to the list now, next element. Well, the next element, I don't know what the next element in this case is. Oh, Bob. Do we have Bob in the collection? No, we don't. So we're going to repeat the first step we did to create a new empty list, stick it in with the Bob into the collection. How many lines of code would we need to write that? Oh, quite a few, right? More important, who here is so excited to write that? Not anybody, right? In fact, nobody cares to write that code. And in fact, the time you think you have to write the code is when you want to take a break, right? And you try to find somebody else to write that code. That's so boring to write. Why? Because it's low level, it's primitive, nothing exciting, it's manual labor. Well, why can't we just be declarative about it and say, hey, you do this, I don't want to really spend the time doing this. So let's try it. So stream, so people, dot stream dot collect and then I'm going to say grouping uh, by so where's grouping by coming from well grouping by is coming from the collectors interface as well collectors as well so we got grouping by well what do you want to group based on person's name is what I want to group on so you can see in this case we have done the grouping and with all the trouble I went through to explain it, I actually wrote fewer lines of code than the words I used to explain how I would do this imperatively, right? So in this case, you simply say grouping by get name. So you can see the name is the name of the person, but the value is an, a list where the list contains the people who have the same name. So this is how you can use grouping by to get the value very easily. But let's change this a little bit. I don't want the list like this. Given a list of people, create a map where their name is the key and the value is all the, all the ages of people with, well, let's say, that name. So I don't want people's um, names are, are the people themselves. I only want their ages. So given Sarah, I want to know what the Sarah ages are. Given Bob, I want to know what ages of all the Bobs are. Well, very simple. Comma mapping. So you continue your story of this transformation. You are saying, while you are grouping, go ahead and group it. But what you're going to put in the value I want you to perform a mapping of what you're going to put in the value. And what kind of mapping I want? Well, I want to take a person and get the age of the person. Great. And then what do you want to do? Well, I want to put it on a list and not a set after all. <laughs> so you can ask him to perform one more operation after this. And in this case, we are saying mapping and then give me a list value out of it. So you can see in this case, you have the names as the key, but the values are no longer people, but the values are ages of the people. So you went from a map of 
string to list of people to map of string to list of string, I'm sorry, integer, assuming that the age is integer. So you can see how you're able to perform the transformation even further and mapping and grouping even further, that becomes very easy. So grouping so uh, and mapping as well. So that gives you an idea about how you are able to perform these operations very effectively. But the question still remains, what about performance? How are we going to deal with performance and what is going to be the efficiency of this code? That becomes still important thing to consider. So to understand that, let's go back to the example we saw earlier and talk through or think through the performance consequences real quick. So let's say in this case, given a list of numbers, but I got a little change in the list. One, two, three, five, four, six, seven, uh, 10, let's say 11, 12, 13, I can keep going like this. And let's say I have all these values, doesn't matter how many we have, all these values. So I got about 20 values on my hand. And here's the problem I wanna perform. The first thing I want to perform is, given an ordered list, right, it's got some ordering, ordered list, find the double of the first even number greater than three. So I want to get the double of the first even number greater than three. Let's do this in the imperative style to begin with. So what's the very first thing I'm going to do? I'm going to say int the result is equal to zero. Output the result. That's called hope, isn't it? Okay. So now I want to say in this case, the first thing <coughs> for int element coming from numbers. And what's my first step? If element is greater than three and element mod two is equal to zero, why? Double of the first even number greater than three, greater than three and it's even. Great. Result is equal to element times two. So there you have it. Is this good? Break. You want a break? We just had a break. <laughs> oh, break in code. Okay, so I put a break. So let's put a break. Is this correct? No. What is wrong? So you could get a zero? So I hear a no from one person. And a lot of other people are still thinking. That's a good sign. Because that's what imperative code does to you. Right? It scares the heck out of you. You look at it and you look at it again. And you walk away and you rush back and look at it again. Right? You feel that way. I, uh, there are days when you feel this, right? You're about to leave and you're kind of like this, right? Because you want to go, but your mind says, look at it one more time. Something is wrong. Well, something is wrong in this code. And somebody said there's one problem, we'll find out what it is in a minute. Here's the worst thing. You run this code, and guess what? It gave you an eight. So it appears like it's correct. But you know what normally happens with the code like this? Normally the problem with the code like this is, I write the code like this, and about three months later, this person walks into my room, this person whose name is called Tester, and the Tester usually announces, hey Venkat, your code sucks. And I normally tell my tester, don't tell me the obvious. I know my code sucks, but tell me how it sucks today. Because that's what I don't know, right? Because it sucks different every single day. So I want to know why this code sucks, and yeah, there's a problem in the code. We'll come back to that later. But what I'm going to do is, I'm going to output. In this case, I'm going to say numbers.stream. And notice, in this case, I got a stream on my hand. I filter. Given an element, element mark 2 is equal to 0, and filter again. In this case, I'm going to say, let's get the even numbers, uh, 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 numbers greater than 3 first. Given an element, element greater than 3, and then I'm going to say, well, perform a map where given an element, I want element times 2 at this point. Well, great. Then I would say, I want to find the first value out of it and return that to me. So you can see in this case when I run it, unlike the top code which gave it eight, the bottom code gives an optional eight. So it tells us, gives a warning that the result may not exist. To your point, you said, it, what if the list is empty? 
Well, the top code is going to give you a zero, while the bottom code is giving you uh, optional empty. So it warns you already. So a couple of benefits. The first benefit, look at the code in the top. What does that code do? Well, you got to go through the spaghetti to understand what it is doing. Look at the code in the bottom. It's a single pass through it. Given the collection, get me everything greater than three, get me even numbers, double them, find the first one. So it reads very nice, smooth, logically. So it is easy to read, it's easy to understand, it's cute, and it's, it's, it's pleasant to work with. But the question is, what about performance? Now, I don't think anybody in here would be so happy to pay four, four times more performance for the code to be cute. I don't think there's anybody here, right? You're not going to say, oh, this is so cute, I want to take it home. But you say, if you take it home, it'll burn your house down and eat all your food. But I still want to take it. Nobody would say that, right? It's like, no, I don't care how cute it is. I don't want it if it's not going to be easy to ma maintain. It doesn't give you good performance. Well, let's look at what the performance consequence is. Let's go to the code on the top first. Well, let's look through the code's performance here and understand what it's going to do. Look at the example given. I got 20 elements coming in. But we know something about Java. It performs short circuiting. So let's look at the code in the top. Uh, how, I mean, how much work? That's the first thing I'm going to ask. Well, the code in the top, first of all, we got a list coming in. Is the element in the list, well, one, two, three, so on. Is one greater than three? No. Is two greater than three because of short circuiting? No. Three greater than three? No. Is five greater than three? Yes. Five is even? No. Four greater than three? Yes. Four is even? Yes. Double the value four. I'm done. So that was eight units of work, whatever the word units means. And not all the units may be equal, but that's good enough. So eight units of work. Now, even though I have 20 values, I took only eight units of work. Let's go to the code in the bottom. Let's assume for a minute we're not doing anything about optimization. Let's just take it on the face value. Well, we got a list of how many values? 20 values. I want to know if each of the value in the list is greater than three. How many evaluations that is? 20 evaluations. Dead on arrival. 20 is greater than eight. But let's add insult to injury. 20 plus all the even numbers in the collection. I'm sorry, all the numbers greater than three in the collection. Well, how much is that? 17 values. So we're going to examine 20 plus 17. Out of those, we want only even numbers. Well, how many of them are even numbers? Remember, in this case, we only looked at values greater than 3, which is all of these guys. We're going to look at only the even numbers. So that's going to be 4 and 6. Then comes 8 and 10. Then is 12 and 14. Then comes 16 and 18, and then 20. That's nine values. So we examine and get nine values out of it. So we are doubling the nine values, plus finally we get one value out of it. Ignore that. So how much is that? That's a good boatload of code. So we can say 20, 37, and 46 computations. So rather than spending eight units of work, you would end up spending 46 units. And this can only get worse if the collection has more values. While this will still be sitting there and, and watching what you're doing, you'll be doing a lot more work if this were true. Well, thankfully, that's not the case. So we definitely don't want to spend more time, more effort. So the question is, how much time this is going to take? Well, before I answer that question, I'm going to refactor this just a little bit. I'm going to say sample, in this case, e is greater than 3. Replace this with sample. I will say this is e is even. And replace this with sample. We'll call it double it. So let's go ahead and write those functions. Here's the static. And this is going to become int, uh, sorry, boolean. And we'll call it e is greater than 3, which takes a number. And I'm going to go ahead and say, in this case, return the number is greater than 3. And let's also go ahead and write those other three, uh, two functions as well. So this is e is even. And return mod 2 is equal to 0.
And finally, on, on, in this case, we will say this is going to become a int, double it, and we will return number times two. So it produces the same result as it did before, but what's the cost of this? Well, before I answer that, let's talk about streams for a minute. There is one property of stream that is wicked cool, and that is streams are absolutely lazy, kind of like my children. So I'll give you an example of how streams behave, and this will be a very easy to understand. Well, I have a teenager. Well, you know, if you have a teenager, or if you have been a teenager, you know what I'm talking about, right? So I got a teenager, and this is a normal scene at my house. So my wife would tell my son, turn off the TV. It's as if no words were spoken, because nothing happens. And if we're sitting there and still watching, right? And she would say, turn off the TV, nothing happens. And then she would say, clean up your room, like no words were spoken again. And then she would say, you know, why don't you put the trash out? Nothing happens. Then she says, I'm calling daddy. Everything happens. So that word I'm calling daddy triggers the computation. Well, in this example, you could have changed this fine first as call daddy. That's exactly what that function is. So this function says, I'm going to actually trigger the computation. So find the first. There are two sets of functions that are available. Those are called intermediate operations and terminal operations. Intermediate operations are operations that are postponed for evaluation. So let's understand what's going on here. You first of all, you go to the first thing that you see here, which is the stream. You went to the stream and said, hey stream, filter. The stream doesn't run over and do all the work and filter. Instead, what the stream says is it says, oh, okay, here is the function you gave me, I've got it, and it doesn't do any work. Then you come to the stream and say, hey stream, now filter again. Instead of doing the real work, it simply takes the second function, attaches to the first function and says, I've got it, and then just waits. Then you go to this and say, hey you, I want you to do one more thing for me, Go ahead and map. It doesn't do any real work yet. It takes the third function, attaches to it, and says, I've got all the three now. Now nah, I'll wait. So all that this does is it builds the pipeline of functions and doesn't do any function at all. So all you have done is you have built this pipeline, as you can see here. So it builds this pipeline and says, I've got it all ready for you. What do you want now? Well, now you say, I want you to find the first. And the minute you call find first, that's when it triggers the computation to get the result. So if you never call to find first, that's like this pipeline built part never actually being used. So this pipeline is waiting for you to command, and this is a single use pipeline. So the minute you call find first, data runs through it, it's done, and you got the results out. So that's basically what this is going to do. It postpones until you actually call. Well, as a result, this is a very lazy evaluation. That's the first thing about this. Well, not only is the lazy evaluation, then the question is, how much of work are we going to do actually? Well, here comes the charm. Imagine these are your two feet, you're standing up here, so the first thing it doesn't do is it doesn't run through all the uh, collection of data with one function. So let me explain what it doesn't do. It doesn't take the entire stream. It doesn't go to this function and say, I'm going to apply this function on all the values. It doesn't do that. So here is a silly example to think about. Imagine we got quite a number of people in this room. And imagine the operation I want to perform here is, I'm going to pick uh, somebody from this room who has a t-shirt, uh, a black color t-shirt, and who has uh, white shoes, and who is wearing a hat. Well, here's a way I can run through this in a really silly way. I could first say, hello everybody in this room, if you have a black color shirt, a t-shirt, please come over here. Well, there's going to be plenty of people filling up this area, 
because there's quite a few people with the black color shirt here. Great. And once I have all these people here waiting here, I got two lists, original list over there, and list of black shirt people here, uh, t-shirt people here. Then I could say, hey folks, whoever is in this black color shirt, if you are wearing a white shoe, come to this side. So I got people moving over here who has white shoes, and those with no shoes or with other color shoes, they're staying over there. Well, now I got people with white shoes here. Now I got three lists. List of people originally, list of black color t-shirt, list of people with black color t-shirt, and white shoes. Then I'm going to say, those who have a hat, please come over here. That's going to be another, hopefully a smaller group, that's going to be people with black color shirt, uh, white color sh shoes, and a hat. Then I'm going to say, the first person, come over here. That's all I need. Thank you for everybody's help. And I got one person and a room full of ticked off people. Right? Because I did so much work moving people around. And all I really cared for is the gentleman over here with the hat. Right there. Absolutely. Right? And he's like, duh, you could have just called me. We're done. So let's try this again this time. I'm going to do the same thing, but I'm going to do it differently. So what am I going to do? I'm going to go to the first person and say, black color shirt. No. Black color shirt. No. Black color shirt. No. So then, oh, black color shirt. Yes. Shoes, no. Okay, next person. Black color shirt, shoes, yes. No, no hat. I come over here. Oh, black color shirt, white color shoe, hat, got it. And notice I never even disturbed anybody else in the room. So in other words, when I have these three or four or five operations, I'm not applying one operation on the entire collection. Instead, I'm applying all the operations on one element, as many as I can apply, and then the next one, and the next one. So you slice it very differently. So rather than taking the entire collection and doing this one step on every element, instead, you take one element and you apply the entire sequence of these computations on that one element. And only when you are done with that one element, do you take the second element and now you apply that entire vertical sequence on that one element. When you are done with that one element, then you take the third element and then you apply again that vertical sequence of function on that element and so on. So in other words, we take the value 1. So imagine you're standing here. You take the value 1 and say, hey, 1, go. 1 says, I am sorry, I'm not greater than 3. Well, you failed. Hey, 2, go. 2 says, I'm sorry, I'm not greater than 3. 3, no way. 5, oh, yes, I'm greater than 3. Go further. Oh, sorry, I'm not even. And 5 bails out. Hey, 4. Are you greater than three? Yes. Are you even? Yes. Double it. Eight. Fine first. Hey, thanks. I'm done. I don't care about any value after four. So the cost of doing this is exactly the cost of doing the other operation. We said it's eight units of work. Let's see how that's true. So I go back here and say, is greater than three, and I'll say number, and likewise I will say, is even, plus number, and then finally double it plus number. When I run through the code, notice we first examine one, then two, then three. We examine five for even, greater than and even. Then we examine four for greater than, even, and double it. Hey, we got the result. Never touch anything after four, like six, seven, eight, all the way up to 20. How many operations we perform? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So the cost of doing this is exactly the same as the cost of doing this with order of computation, right? So normally when you compare, you look for the order of computations. It's the same order of computation as the other piece of code, not very different from that point of view. And so you absolutely have to measure performance. There's no other solution to it. But from the logical point of view, the computational complexity is ab absolutely the same for the two pieces of code in this case. So this is because of lazy evaluation that you have on your hand. Well, the word lazy 
In Java is pronounced a little differently. You pronounce it as efficient. And so that's basically what you get out of this is the efficiency you get from this. So this gives you quite a bit of power on your hand, as you can see, in terms of how you can compute it. So not only can you get acute code, but acute code actually performs really well, and it's easier to maintain, easier to change as well. So you got all those benefits built in. That's one of the things you get out of this. So given this, notice that when are these evaluations uh, really performed? Well, these evaluations are only performed when you are triggering the, the terminal operation. If you never trigger the terminal operation, it would never evaluate these things. So let's take a look at this another time. So let's actually, I'll save this away. So lazy evaluation. So let's go ahead and take this one more time. So let's go ahead and remove the old code for a minute. Let's get back to just this function alone. And in this case, I'm going to write this. And notice, I'm going to provide all the way through. And at the very end, I'm going to say output done. And you can see in this case, it did all that work. And then it said done. However, if I go back to this code and stop one step short, and I've built up all the pipeline. So this example should really help you. So what did we do at this point? We built this pipeline, but we never exercised the pipeline. So you didn't pass anything to run through the pipeline, so there is no execution at this point. So at this point, at line number 10, you spent the effort building the pipeline, but you didn't do any work. So now when I run this code, you can see none of that really evaluated. This is kind of like some people at work, right? They come in in the morning, they look around and say, where's the boss? Oh, the boss is sick today. Yes, I don't have to do any work. So this is kind of like that. You never call the terminal operation, why do I care to run this? So as a result, you postpone evaluation and you never ever realize that computation. And guess what? That is wonderful, why? Because you are more efficient not when you work faster, but when you don't work at all, right? So this is the ultimate satisfaction in life. You are the most efficient person. You are never late for a project. You could never deliver anything uh, late because you don't do anything. And if you can get to that point where you can attain that level of efficiency, right? So both in life and work, the most efficient people are the most lazy people. So the point really is, you want to postpone it. Now think about this for a minute. Let's say your boss comes to you and says, on February the 1st, your boss says, I want you to work on this project, and I want this uh, report and, and delivered, everything delivered on April the 1st. Very appropriate day for delivering this. What would you do? I'm sure you are so committed to this project, you will start working on this very promptly on March 31st, right? Because it's due on April the 1st. And that's what we do. But there's no reason to start this early, especially though, if you know you're going to quit this work on March 15th, why would you be crazy to start this any sooner? But on the other hand, some of us have this boring boss, like, like I am usually. Your project is due on April the 1st, but I want the interim report every Friday. Now life sucks. Because every Friday you gotta turn up something, right? So the point really is, there is something we gotta be careful about. Lazy evaluation, evaluation, is possible only if um, the functions do, don't have side effect. So I gave a poor example in this case. Notice in my function, I was printing the results. Those are side effects, you should never do this. Because we are printing stuff, then people will know whether your code is running or not. So for lazy evaluation to be effective, your functions cannot have side effects. So in other words, whether you ran the code or didn't run at all, the world should never see the difference. So not having side effect is extremely important. So uh, don't print stuff 
like I do in this example. So that's not a good idea. You need to have functions with no side effect because otherwise the world will know whether you're running the function or not. So that's very critical to have. So as much as possible, you want to avoid side effects. And of course, then you can reap the benefit of lazy evaluation. So let's go ahead and say lazy at work. All right. So we saw the laziness so far. But what does this really mean in terms of how we can benefit from this? I want to talk about characteristics of streams so we can understand how streams actually behave. So when it comes to streams, there are four characteristics of a stream. A stream may be sized or it could be unsized. So what does it mean by a stream is unsized? It is boundless. It has no limits to it. And that's one property. The second is a stream may be ordered or unordered. An ordered stream, of course, has ordering, first element, second element, third element, and unordered, pretty much there's no ordering at all. It could be distinct or non-distinct. A stream does not enforce distinctness, or the stream might enforce distinctness. And a third thing is, it could be sorted or unsorted. How do you know what your property is? Let's examine uh, with an example here to see what those properties would be. So the first thing here, let's say I have a collection of numbers. And in this case, I'm going to say numbers 1 through 5. But I'm also going to repeat that as numbers 1 through 5 here. So this is a list I have on my hand. So I'm going to go back here and say, hey, list numbers.stream. And I'm going to ask him to get me only the even numbers. So filter given a number element mod 2 is equal to 0. And I'm going to say for each and system dot out. And I'm going to print line, print it. Well, what can I say about this stream? Couple of things. It is sized. How do I know it's sized? Based on where you came from. You came from a list. And we know a list is bounded. It is sized. It is ordered. How do we know it's ordered? Well, a list is ordered. First element, second element, third element, I know that. Well, not only is it sized and ordered, we also know it is non-distinct. How do we know it's non-distinct? Because list can have duplicates. So it doesn't prevent you from having duplicates. And the last thing is non-sorted. How do we know it's non-sorted? Because the values are non-sorted when I run through it. So you can see 2, 4, 2, 4, non-sorted ordered, non-distinct. So we can see that the property here is, is, is what we get. So we'll say save this as properties of streams. Well, let's do this again. But this time, I'm going to change it just a little bit. What if I were to say, in this case, filtered and sorted? Well, I'm going to ask him to sort the value. Notice this 2424. Two, so this becomes sorted. So we went from uh, non-sorted to sorted. That is another way you can change it. So there are two ways you can change the property of a stream. One way you can change the property of a stream is where you came from. The original collection dictates the properties. But you can also change the property along the way by tinkering with certain operations. We took what was non-sorted, non-distinct, and made it sorted, non-distinct. That's what we did in this particular case. So this becomes a sorted, and let's go ahead and save this as uh, changing a property to sorted. So we sorted it, but you can do something else. Notice one more time, look at the output, 2424. Four. Well, it's non-sorted, so let's go back and put non-sorted here, great. And then what, it is also non-distinct. But I'm gonna change it to, in this case, distinct. So now if you notice, distinct. And if you notice in this case, there we go. And what does it say? It's 2, 4. No longer do you have the duplicate value. So if I remove the distinct, you can see 2, 4, 2, 4. If I keep that in there, it is distinct. So once again, changing a distinct, uh, distinct, property. So you can see how we can start varying properties of streams uh, very effectively. 
So what we have on our hand is streams that could be sized or unsized, streams that could be ordered or unordered, like if I started with a set, it could be distinct or non-distinct and sorted or non-sorted, and depending on where you came from and what you do along the way, you can start changing these properties. Now obviously, if you start with the set, you would already start with the sized, you would start with an unordered and the distinct and unsorted. So it really depends on what your source is. If you start with a, maybe a, a, a sorted set already, then you would have a distinct, unordered, sorted, and sized. So it depends on where you start and what you do along the way. But this leads to that question, what about sized? Well, if you start with a physical collection, you're going to have a sized along the way. But you can also have what is called an infinite stream, something that has absolutely no size at all, and that pays for some really fun uh, programming um, capabilities. Let's first create an uh, infinite stream, then we will make use of it in a little example. So how do I create an infinite stream? Stream.iterate. And I'm going to say, given an element, in this case, I'm going to say, let's say 100, given an element, element plus 1. So just notice that for a minute. This one is an infinite stream. So what does this do? Start with 1, 100. So start with 100. Create a series, which is 100, and then 101, 102, 103, and so on. So this is going to be keep on going and create a stream which is absolutely boundless. So this is an example of an unsized stream. Now clearly the question is, what is it going to do when I run this code? So I'm going to output this, and of course I need the stream on my hand to work with this, so stream.stream. .stream. So if I bring this in, I run it, notice all it did was it provided a pipeline head. So it gave me a head of the pipeline. This is extremely smart. It says, I'm an infinite stream, but I'm extremely lazy. So it's not going to do any work until you demand the work on it. It is so you know, infinite, but it's not going to do any work until you call on it. So here's a way to think about it. It's maybe like you go to a, a, a public office where there's a lot of people waiting, and you know how this goes, right? When a lot of these people are waiting, you got a long line to wait, but your legs can get tired. So what do they do? You normally go to this machine and you pluck out a ticket. And you look at the ticket and say, oh, my ticket number is 752. Oh, it's a long wait. And you go sit down and you can wait for eternity, right? And the next person comes and plucks another ticket. What is that? Well, that's 783. Third person, 784. So everybody gets the next sequence in the list. If you ever doubt this is an infinite stream, take a little kid with you, right? Starts collecting all these tickets, like stop it, right? And it got 10, all of them sequential. Well, it keeps on giving those values. That's an example of an infinite series. So what, what we have on our hand is an infinite series. So we created an infinite stream. So creating uh, an infinite stream. Now, infinite streams cannot exist without laziness. Laziness cannot exist without, side uh, without no side effect. And no side effect cannot exist without immutability. So that is one of the reasons why immutability is so important. We are not saying make things immutable not because it's fashionable. We are saying make things immutable because immutability paves way to no side effect. No side effect paves way to laziness. Laziness paves way to infinite streams as well. But how can we use this to solve uh, problems that we would otherwise have difficulty solving? Let's take one example here. So let's say, given a number n, let's say number k, and a count n, find the uh, double of the even numbers uh, starting with k. So find the double of let's say double of n even numbers, starting with k, where each number is, uh, where 
square root of each number is greater than 20. So that's a problem I want to solve. Let's say given a number k and a count, find the double of n even number starting with k, where the square root of each of the number is greater than 20. Let's first write the code for it and then see how we're going to change it. So I'm going to call this function, we'll call it compute, and we will send a value of k and a value of n. Well, what in the world is k? Well, int k equals, let's say, 121. Well, int n equals 51. Great. Let's get started. So public, let's say static. Well, this is going to become a total of the uh, total, right? I forgot to mention the total. So total of the total of. Um, so find the total of the double. So find the total of. OK, so that's going to be a single value. So int compute, let's say k and n. Well, that should be fairly easy to do, isn't it? So what should I do? Well, I've got a result I want to return. So return result. Well, what's the result? Result is equal to zero. Great. What's the next step? I got to start with k, but I got a value beyond k. So let's say index is equal to k. After all, I'm starting with the value k. But it says it's got to be an even number. So if the value k is even, so index mod 2 is equal to zero, but it also says and the math dot square root of the value index is greater than 20. Well, if it is, I got to add it to the total, or the, uh, uh, double of it to the total. So uh, result, so this has got to be a result. Let's change this to result. So result is equal to, a uh, plus equal to, and that's going to be the index times 2. But we got to keep looping through it. Well, yeah, sure. So while, and I'm going to say int count is equal to 0, and while count is less than n. Wait, is it less than n? Or is it less than or equal to n? Which one is it? See how you're thinking? You think about this every single time, don't you? And you then think about it, is it less than, less than, equal to? You say less than, and then you come back and look at it one more time. Is it really less than? And you feel a bit scared, isn't it? These are, there's only one value for code like this. They have been created to make programmers look stupid. Because every time you write this, you pause and like, is this the day I'm going to get off by one error? Well, we got the value in the loop, great. Are we done? No. What do we do? Increase the count. Well, OK. So I'm going to say index plus plus and count plus plus. Is that good? No. It's got to be within the f. OK, let's move it within the f. Well, not there. One has to be in, one has to be out. Which one is it? There's not enough hour and a day to get this right, isn't it? So when you're done with this, you look at this code and you feel absolutely silly, isn't it? Because that's a lot of work to write this simple code. And what does this do? You set the k, you set the count, count is less than n. Then you say if it is even and greater than 20, then I want to add that to the result double of that. Increase the count because I found a value. Well, increase the index and then go through it. And then you get the result finally. And is it right? We, let's hope it's right. OK. Well, you write code like this. Or let's try this one more time. Let's take all this garbage, comment it out, try this one more time. Let's say return. So what am I going to return? Stream.iterate from k given an element, element plus 1. Right off the bat, you are iterating from element k all the way, keep going. Well, what am I going to do? Filter. Given an element, element mod 2 is equal to 0. Great, I got all the even numbers. Filter again. Given an element, math.square root of the element greater than 20. And then what happened? Well, I got the values I want. And now I have to double it. Map to int. 
And what am I going to double it with? Given an element, element times two. Are we done? No, we got to tell him only to get n values. How do we do that? Limit n. Did you notice something? Not less than n. Not less than or equal to n. It's n, damn it. Let's keep going, right? So you're not wasting your time. It doesn't make you look like a fool, right? So it's as simple as saying that. Then dot sum. And I'm done. Get me the result, please. So let's see how this works. Given an infinite series starting with k, get me only even numbers. Get me only numbers, even numbers that are, whose square root is greater than 20. Double them, but I only want n values and total them. So we went through the same exercise here, but look at the difference between the two pieces of code. The first piece of code makes you feel like you are really stupid. The second piece of code makes you feel like you can get your work done and move on. So one makes you more intelligent, the other kind of drains you down, pulls you down. And you can see the difference between these two. And the power of streams is just amazing in ability to express code like this. So you're starting out by saying, given an infinite stream, let's understand a couple of things that go in this code. What are the characteristics here? The first thing about this characteristics is, this is uh, un unbounded. There is no bound to it. And what? Lazy. It's unbounded and lazy at the same time. Hey, what about this? Unbounded and lazy as well. What about the next one? Well, this is unbounded and lazy as well. Hey, what about here? That is unbounded and lazy as well. This one here, what about this? It is sized or bounded but uh, and lazy. It is still lazy because limit says, I'm not going to do any work. I will wait until n values go through. So here is how limit works, right? Limit doesn't do any work. And limit kind of sits there and sipping its nice favorite drink, doing nothing. And suddenly, one goes through. It's like, oh, do you see that? Somebody went through. Count one, two, three, right? And the minute 100 goes through, it does this. That's it. I'm not going to let anything go through, right? When does it do that? Only when 100 goes through. When will this happen? Life happens, right? So it says, I'm not going to get excited about this. I'm just going to be lazy. So every one of this is lazy. And the only thing that ever keeps everything in control is the poor sum. And it comes to the end and says, all right, let's get our work done. And if sum never came through, none of these would ever do any work. So sum is the one that triggers this evaluation and makes all this work. So limit is absolutely lazy as well. So how do you know if a function is lazy or if it's eager? Actually, it's a very, very simple. Look for the return type of that function. So to understand this, let's go back here and look for the return types. So I'm going to go back here and I'm going to output right here. And I'm going to output just the filter. So let's output the filter alone and see what it does, what, give, what it gives us. Notice that's a stream. That's what filter gave us. Let's go one more step. Get to the second filter and see what it gives us. Well, notice that gives a stream as well. Let's do one more thing. Let's go to the map here and see what it gives us. Well, notice in this case, the map is going to give us the filter a stream as well. Great. Now let's go back one more time. Go to the limit right here and see what the limit gives us. And limit is going to come back in this case, and oh, let's stop at the limit properly. So this is the l end of the limit. Yeah. Yep, yep, let's fix that. So in this case, there we go. So I'm going to come to the limit. And what am I going to put in the limit? That's a stream as well. So bunch of complete lazy stuff until you finally come down and say dot sum, 
well, I want the result at this point. Well, obviously, that's a non-stream. So how do you know? Well, go through the function and see what does it return. Any function that returns a stream from a stream is lazy. Anything that returns a non-stream would become an eager evaluation at that point. So those are the terminal functions, like sum, min, max, count, find first, uh, reduce, collect. All of those are terminal functions. Things like filter, limit, skip, a map, uh, all those things are intermediate functions. So we get efficiency by postponing operations until we no longer can postpone them. And that is basically what we are getting here. So we employed uh, the uh, concept of lazy evaluation. Now, one beauty of this is your code becomes concise, your code becomes expressive, your code becomes easier to understand, easier to maintain, and it's also easier to change as well. If you notice, every single line of code here is absolutely cohesive, focused on one thing and one thing well, and that's all you're doing. So using infinite, uh, infinite streams, and I will save that example there for you also. So I sincerely hope you found this useful. Thank you.